Well, good morning. It's uh, almost the afternoon. This is the late crowd, so you're well brunched, well fed, and well slept. Um, so we are so excited to be celebrating this Easter Sunday with you. My name is Ash. I am on staff here at Grace Commons. Um, it is good to be together in person and online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, my hopes, even though you are well slept, is that you caught some pictures of the sunrise this morning and even perhaps our sunrise service. There was this beautiful cross that sort of slipped its way in behind us. Um, it was just this picture of God is clearly with us this morning. So I am delighted to be amidst you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please keep your masks on uh, and do your best to stay socially distanced as you can. Um, and at the end, you'll be dismissed by our ushers and then the hope is that we can congregate outside and embrace this beautiful Boulder day. Um, this past several weeks, we've been in this Lenten series that we're calling In the Wilderness. We've been looking at how God has been with his people all along through the wilderness and what that means for you and for me today. And so we're continuing on and sort of wrapping up that series. And I want to read a verse from Isaiah over you that really was this forecasting or this foreshadowing of what we celebrate in fullness this morning. And so here we go. It says, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God. And so this morning, as we come together on this Easter morning, I am going to lead us in that famous Easter litany where we declare that Christ is risen. So here we go. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. All righty. Well, it is so wonderful to see each of your faces here this Easter morning. And um, we're going to kick us off with some worship. This is a song that we introduced about two weeks ago, and we thought it would just be the perfect way to start off our worship this morning. So we are going to jump right into Let the Light In. You guys can stand with us. It's time for the sleeper to wake. It's time for the always to change. I hear the Spirit say it's time. It's time for the dead man to rise.
the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light stay standing as we continue into our next piece of worship. Happy Easter, everyone. What a powerful Resurrection Sunday to be together. You may be seated. So, so glad you are here. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Corinthians that if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then we are to be pitied more than all. But indeed, he has risen. And because we serve a Savior who has risen from the dead, who has triumphed over the grave, who has conquered death, we are able to come into the presence of the Lord with great confidence in his ability and power to intervene in our lives. And with that confidence in mind, I invite you to join me in prayer now. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
we give you great thanks for this beautiful day and the powerful reminder of what this day means in our lives, in our faith, that Jesus, on this day, you rose from the dead. You conquered death. You triumphed over evil. And Lord, we remind ourselves of that this morning as we come into your presence and boldly ask for your resurrection power to be released in our lives. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room who might be facing any number of challenges or difficulties. And Lord, we remember this morning that when you are involved, it's never over. God, you are the God who brings life where there was death. And so, Lord, I pray for the the difficult moments that we're walking through as a church, as a community, as a nation, across our planet. Lord, we ask, God, that today that our hearts would be infused with your hope. God, that we would be reminded of your power in our lives. As we lift our hearts and our eyes to you today, we remember that you are majestic and victorious. Lord, we pray that you stir within each of our hearts an anticipation of what you want to do in our lives, in our church, in our community. And Lord, we continue to pray for those who have suffered great tragedy here in these last couple weeks. Lord, we pray for the families of those who, who lost a loved one in the shooting. And we continue to pray, Lord, that your spirit would bring great comfort and grace to each of these families today. Lord, would you remind them that because you rose from the dead, that death isn't final. And Lord, we pray as well for the the persecuted church around the world who, who would gather together on this very day and great risk and peril for their own lives just to be together, to worship you. Lord, we pray for your resurrection power to be released in the nations today. Lord, that you might be exalted, that you might be lifted up, that you would draw all men and women unto yourself. Lord, we pray that you would do your great work across our globe today as we join our hearts and our praise with our brothers and sisters all around the world. Lord, you are awesome, and we give you great praise. Lord, we thank you for your resurrection power. May it stir our hearts and transform our lives. Lord, this, this moment, what we celebrate today, completely changed the course of history. And Lord, we pray that it will continue to transform our hearts, our lives, our church, our community, and the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may stay seated as we enjoy a piece from our choir.
you guys can stand with us. We're going to continue with another song. Um, as Pastor Daniel was praying, a Bible verse came to mind. Um, I don't know the exact reference, but one of you might. You can yell it out as I'm saying it. Um, it is, in this world, we will have trouble. So we're guaranteed hardship, you know. Um, being a Christian isn't necessarily easy. Well, from my opinion so far, yours turned 24. But it's been really gnarly sometimes, really hard. Um, but that verse does say, in this world we will have troubles, but take heart because he, he is in Jesus, has overcome the world. Amen? Amen. So I know a lot of you guys know this song, so feel free to sing it out and let's worship together.
Amen. Thanks well, for seeing Well, hallelujah. Did you all hear the news? Jesus is alive. Very exciting. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Great stuff. Well, hey, in the, in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John tells us that we overcome the enemy of our souls by the blood of Jesus and by the word of our testimony. Our testimonies matter. Our stories matter because they show us how God is at work in our lives. They show us how his resurrection power is moving and changing things. And this morning, I'm pleased to let you know that we've got a little testimony uh, via video from Ned and Stephanie Steffens, who are some of our missionaries uh, in Spain. And they went through quite an ordeal last year. Many of you are aware of that, and you know their story. But their testimony is powerful. And as we listen to it today, I want to invite you to just receive encouragement in your heart of the power of the great God we serve. Check it out. Ned and Stephanie, so you've been serving together in Spain for, for how long? We've been married just over eight years. Okay. I, I've been here about 18 years total, and he's been here longer than that. What, where, were your, where were you at when 2020, you know, 2020 happened? What, um, what was your situation when the pandemic hit? We uh, were actually had just arrived in the States in January, Colorado. We needed to be there for our home assignment or our furlough. Our original plan was to be there for six months. And of course, in January, we didn't have any idea what, what God had in store for us. I was, I started getting a, a fairly high fever and we thought maybe it was some other type of infection or something. I was up to 104 degrees and pneumonia had started in my lungs. So that's when that whole process uh, started. Uh, I was actually uh, in Boulder Hospital a total of 34 days. The first about 15, I was intubated. I had a, a breathing machine obviously sedated, so I don't remember any of that at all. When they removed that and I started to, to wake up, I was pretty, uh, the wires weren't connecting completely, so I was a little bit confused for a good amount of time. I needed a, a pretty extensive rehabilitation yeah. uh, for three things, mainly swallowing, speaking, and walking. Those were all at zero. Uh, there was an attempt to get me a, to take me to a rehab facility, but I kept testing positive for COVID. And at that point in time, April of 2020, rehab facilities were not taking people testing positive. With COVID, you, no one can come see you. Yeah. So uh, I would say it was about the last two weeks in the hospital, we were able to communicate with uh, iPads. So that really helped a lot. But it was still very... But we didn't see each other the whole time. The whole... I dropped him off at the ER. And on March 30. I had no idea that it would be five weeks later I would get to see him. Yeah. Then, so. Wow. Yeah, face to face. I think one thing that, that surprised me in my conversations with God, I never did ask why. It was easy to let my mind go to what could happen, rather than thinking about what is. Uh, and when I stopped and recognized who God is and um, what is true about God and what is true about my relationship with Him and our relationship with Him, uh, that grounded me a little bit more, I would say. Um, but it was it was difficult um, to not let my mind go off. So I had to focus on truth, just stick to the truth. God really uh, very thankful for his intervention, great hospital staff, and for Stephanie, because she did a great job of communication through what's called Caring Bridge. Yeah. So that people could pray. Um, I'm convinced those three things are the three main factors that helped me make it through all that. So they actually started the rehab at, at Boulder Hospital, and I was able to make enough progress to be able to go home on May 3rd, I think it was. I think. I could have possibly been maybe one of their first, in a sense, success stories. So right. they were celebrating as much as I was. He was their first success story, I think, and the nurses were so excited that he had recovered because we didn't know if he would have been, and it gave them a chance to celebrate. So yeah. it, was, it was special, hopefully for them, very special for us. Uh, I've historically had issues with trying to control situations and different things. 
and I was completely out of control in this one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think too that the, 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 the power of prayer, I mean, just to see people, some people, we don't even know who they are. <laughs> they said, we're praying for you, we're so and so. But in response to what she had, she had written. So just that it was a very big lesson on who's in control, God's in control. Wow, what a testimony, and what a wilderness that they went through. Um, and what you, many of you went through it with them. You prayed, you supported them. Thank you so much. We uh, have been, during the season of Lent, 40 days leading up to Easter, in a sermon series called In the Wilderness. And we have been learning that all God's people go through the wilderness. And in the wilderness, God goes with us, God provides for us, and God promises new life. Now, out of the wilderness of Lent, we come to the abundance of Easter. And I want to share with you a passage from John's Gospel. John chapter 19, beginning at verse 40. You can follow along. John writes, taking Jesus' body, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for this ancient testimony. We pray that you would breathe into it by your Holy Spirit and make it come alive in our hearing and in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. There he goes again, my mother muttered. Sure enough, I looked out the kitchen window to the front yard, and there was my dad on his ladder with the pruning shears chopping away. 
When I was a kid growing up, Saturday mornings were for gardening for my German dad. My dad was an aggressive gardener. He was from the old school. When he pruned the acacia trees and potato vines, he held nothing back. He chopped and he hacked right down to the nub. When he finished, our garden could look barren and brutalized, but not forever, not for long, because a strange thing happened. The more dad cut things back, the more they sprang to life. Before long, those denuded vines and barren branches were bursting with life. Dad's scorched earth gardening brought life. My first job as a kid was to work in the garden for old Mrs. Fry, a woman in our neighborhood. She taught me how to prune rose bushes and rake, but most importantly, she showed me the wonders of composting. Take the clippings, the leaves, put them in a compost bin, give them time, stir them up, and they yielded life. Good, dark, rich soil from which life sprang. Old Mrs. Fry taught me, out of death comes life. I'd love to say that since then I've become an avid gardener that I have a green thumb, but it wouldn't be true. I'm what you might call a shame gardener. That means that I garden because I don't want our yard to embarrass me or my family in front of our neighbors and our friends. So gardening for me is not a fun hobby like for some of you. But my limited gardening has taught me some life lessons. I've learned that in the garden, hacking, chopping, pruning, weeding, digging, mulching, as brutal as these things seem, they bring life. God has built this lesson right into creation. Under God's hands, barrenness is temporary, but life is eternal. That's the story of Lent as it leads us to Easter. Barrenness is temporary, but life is eternal. The Bible is a story of life, of how the God of life caused all creation to flourish. To depict this, the Bible begins its story in a garden, Gan Eden, according to the Hebrews, the Garden of Eden, which the Persians later would call paradise, and the name is stuck. In the Garden of Eden, there was life, abundant life, life with God, life with each other, life with all creation. And there was shalom, warmth of relationship, harmony, peace. God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, and it was good. There was life. But God's life was founded on a freedom for us to freely choose God or to choose ourselves as Lord. And many of you know this story. We chose ourselves as Lord, and sin entered the world, and along with it, death. Adam and Eve were thrust out of the garden east of Eden, and much of the rest of the Bible's story takes place in a wilderness, literal and figurative. Abraham, filled with God's promises of future fruitfulness, must walk the desert first. Moses and the Israelites escape the slavery in Egypt, only to wander Sinai's wilderness for 40 years. Even when Israel is established in the land, they choose self over God, and God must bring in the Babylonians to whisk them away to Mesopotamia for exile for 70 years. Wilderness, wilderness, wilderness. But God, God is a God of life, and God pursues people into the wilderness, and God sends them a prophet like Isaiah, who assures the exiles life will return. Listen to what Isaiah promised them. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. After 70 years, the Judean captives left Babylon and were brought back into Jerusalem. But you know something? The wilderness was still with them. 
for the life that they experienced was not the garden in its fullness that Isaiah had promised. Even though they were back in Jerusalem, they were still in a wilderness, waiting, watching, longing. The garden is a unifying theme in the Bible. It's a powerful image of life. In the Bible, the garden means nature at its best, romantic love at its best, human well-being at its best, spirituality at its best. Friends, this is why when John, the gospel writer, tells the story of Easter, he puts it in the garden. The garden. Alone of the four gospel writers, John puts the resurrection Jesus of Jesus carefully in the garden. In fact, John's whole gospel is a retelling of the whole Bible story. John goes back to the very beginning, the book of Genesis. As he begins the gospel, he uses the very same words. In the beginning. In the beginning was the word, this term for the Son of God who became a man, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then John goes on to say, in him was life. John is echoing Genesis to tell us that God is making a new Garden of Eden in Jesus. And John goes on to tell us more about gardens. uh, Jesus is betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is buried in a garden tomb. And Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene mistaken for a gardener. How perfect is that? Like Adam and Eve in Genesis, Jesus is a fresh new human being. He's one who works in a garden with God to bring life. A lot of you who like gardening know that gardening is a divine and human partnership. We work the soil, we plant the seeds, we water, but God, God brings the growth. Jesus is this perfect gardener, this perfect blend of divine and human working to bring life. And if that weren't enough, John looks forward in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, to the fulfilled garden in Jesus. There, the river of life runs through the tree of life, bringing healing to the nations. Life, life, life. All of it in a garden, all of it in Jesus Christ. This is the Bible story. This is John's gospel story. This is the Easter story. In our Lenten sermon series, we thought a lot about the crocus. Do you remember that? In Isaiah 35, which Ash read for us earlier, we heard God promise the desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. The crocus is the first flower in the Middle East that pushes its way up from winter's ground. The crocus is the sign of spring to come. Friends, Jesus is the crocus, the first fruits of the new life that God wants to give us. Now, sometimes, admittedly, it's hard for us to see this. Wilderness seems complete. It's in us, it's around us, and especially right now. But as with the crocus, Easter reminds us that Jesus brings life. Jesus brings life. Barrenness is temporary. Life is everlasting. Well, you look around yourself these days, and Boulder County is barren. It's brown. It's beige. We long for greenery. We long for spring colors. Well, Boulder County may be barren, but I'm here to tell you that Contra Costa County in Northern California, it's lush. It's green. It's like Ireland. Let me show you a picture. This is Briones Park in Martinez, California, a quarter mile from where my sister-in-law and her family live. And Rapali and I walked the hills of this park, and you can see it's green and beautiful. There are wildflowers in bloom, and the oak trees are leafing out. There is springtime in Contra Costa County. And then later that week, they took me to a birthday dinner in Napa Valley, and we walked before dinner uh, out into the garden of this farm-to-table restaurant. Here's the picture. 
And there were these fields of mustard seeds, mustard flowers, as far as you could see, yellow and lushness. And it was a reminder that spring has sprung and there is life. There is life and it's coming to Boulder County. And you can see it if you've got an eye for it. Winter will not last. Spring is on its way. And we need to hold on. We need to have hope. At Easter, we remember that a garden springs up in the wilderness. Fruitfulness overcomes barrenness. God's life defeats death in Jesus Christ. I know a lot of Christians are upset at the paganization of Easter. With all its crass consumerism and commerciality, they feel that Easter is utterly lost on our secular world. But I'm not so sure. I think our secular society still understands just a little bit of Easter. Why do folks wear colorful clothing at Easter? Life, because colors represent springtime. Why do we have Easter eggs? Life, eggs bring life. Why is there an Easter bunny? Life, because rabbits reproduce. (laughs) Why celebrate with chocolates and candy and delicious meals and rich desserts with those we love at Easter? Why? Life, life, life. Easter brings life. That's the lesson of the garden. That's the lesson of Jesus. Jesus said famously earlier in John's gospel, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Friends, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Believe the good news. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we long to experience more of your life. And even as spring shows us signs of life to come, Lord, may we know this refreshment as well, where we desperately need your life. Bring it. Bring it to my friends here in this room and those online. Bring us your life, and we thank you for it. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you, Carl. Um, We're going to head into another time of singing together. And um, this next song that we're going to sing happens to be one of my favorite Easter songs. I think it's just a really beautiful and powerful representation of the story that we get to celebrate today. Um, And I, um, I just love this image that we're given um, of our God, who is our King, who came to earth not to gain um, power, not to gain riches, but just simply to gain us. And um, that is why we sing praises to him. So you can stand and join us in singing King of Kings.
and held its breath till the stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs. Thanks for singing with us. You can stay standing as we continue in song. gift it's been to worship with all of you on this Easter Sunday morning. We are delighted that you could take part uh, at home or here in person. Um, We want to also say welcome back because I know that a number of you, this is your first time setting foot in this church, in the building itself for more than a year. So welcome back. It feels like things are indeed leading to a springtime of our souls and that's such good news. We want uh, you to be aware that uh, we'd like you in a moment to be seated and remain seated until the ushers dismiss you. And there are going to be two ways you can exit the building. You can either go through the courtyard or back out um, through the east doors. And we would ask that if you want to congregate and catch up, just do that outside where it's a little safer to do that. We want to send you out with a blessing, but before that, I cannot resist. I want to do the Easter litany with you one more time. You know the drill. Let's do it together. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. 
Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated.